Jesus always knew the right thing to say. In every situation, through every challenge, in every difficulty, Jesus always said exactly what needed to be said. It's an awesome thing to behold. In Luke chapter 4, verse 22, as he was reading the scriptures in the synagogue, the Bible tells us that the people marveled at the gracious words that came out of his mouth. In John 7, verse 46, they said about Jesus, no one ever spoke like this. In Mark chapter 12, verse 37, the Bible tells us that the common people heard him gladly. They were glad to hear what Jesus had to say. One of his own disciples in John 6, verse 68, remarked, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus always knew exactly what to say. And that's hard. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Matthew 12, verse 34. We are to speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. We're to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, verse 15. It's difficult to know the right thing to say to the right people at the right time for the right reasons. It's difficult to have that kind of wisdom. Jesus always knew what to say. In a life that was filled with preaching and teaching, Jesus saved his greatest sermon for the cross. The Bible tells us that he spoke seven times while suffering on the cross. This might be interesting for you to study. Matthew and Mark only record one statement, one alone. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27 verse 46. John records three statements from the cross. John 19, verses 26 and 27, Jesus speaks to his disciple and says, behold your mother. And then he speaks to his mother and says, behold your son. Again, in John 19, verse 30, or 19, verse 28, Jesus says, I thirst. And in John 19, verse 30, it is finished. But then you turn to the book of Luke. Open your Bibles there if you haven't already done so this morning. In Luke 23, there are three statements that Jesus makes from the cross that are found only in the book of Luke. That's not to say that the other writers just didn't know he said these things, but they were writing for different purposes, giving you a different perspective on the cross and on the life of Christ. But what I'm fascinated about in Luke 23 is that everything Jesus says from the cross in Luke 23 is full of grace full of mercy, full of assurance. When you look at Luke 23, you'll notice in verse 34, Jesus says first, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then when you look down in Luke 23, verse 43, maybe if you've got one of those Bibles that has the red letters that attribute the words of Jesus, Luke 23, verse 43, truly I say to you, this day you will be with me in paradise. And then in Luke 23, verse 46, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Let's make those the three points of our study this morning as we think about what Jesus has done for us at the cross, as we think about the fact that Jesus always knew exactly what to say. Look, if you will, first this morning at Luke 23, verse 34. They were nailing him to the cross putting nails through his hands and his feet. They were immobilizing him and suspending him between heaven and earth. The pain had to have been enormous, intense, indescribable. And as they put that cross into place, here is the first thing that Jesus is recorded as having said from the cross. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Three observations about those words. Number one, it is a prayer. Did you ever notice that? Out of the seven statements that the scripture records, Jesus having given from the cross, three of those seven statements are prayers. 
Matthew 27, 46, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Luke 23, 46, that we're going to study in a moment. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And this one, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. In his moment of greatest agony and suffering, in his moment of greatest injustice that he was suffering at the hands of unrighteous people, Jesus went to his father three times in prayer. He instructs us, doesn't he? Jesus was a man of prayer. His ministry was marked by prayer. He was constantly going to God in prayer, so much so that his disciples once said one time, Lord, teach us to pray. We want to be able to pray like that, Luke 11, verse 1. And he taught indeed his disciples, us, that we ought always to pray and never to lose heart, Luke 18, verse 1. And so it's fitting that the first thing he says from the cross And indeed, the last thing he says from the cross, their prayers. Notice, secondly, as you look at this statement, forgiveness. Father, forgive them. There is sin being committed. There is wrong that's taking place. There is injustice, and there's really no other way to to sugarcoat this or to explain it away. The people that were doing this knew that what they were doing was sin. They knew that what they were doing was unjust, and they didn't care. And Jesus, in the moment in which he's being nailed to the cross, prays for forgiveness. And that tells me three things about forgiveness. In the first place, forgiveness is now available. It's available to you and it's available to me. It's available in Jesus Christ. How do you know that, John? I know that because the people that committed the greatest injustice ever committed in this world, Jesus prayed for them to have forgiveness available. And that reminds you and me then that no matter what we've done, no matter what has happened in our past, Jesus wants to forgive us too. And you need to hear my words this morning. Forgiveness is available to you. The scripture tells us we have the forgiveness of sins through his blood, Ephesians 1 verse 7. Jesus wants to forgive people. Father, forgive them. It's available, but it's also secondly conditional. I do not believe for a minute that just because Jesus prayed this prayer, that those people who were still put, pounding the nails into his hands and feet, that somehow magically all of their sins went away. Forgiveness in scripture is always conditional. Later on in Acts chapter two, Peter accused his audience on that occasion of being the very ones who had taken Jesus with lawless hands and crucifying him. Acts 2 verse 23, let all the house of Israel, he he says as he concludes the sermon, know assuredly that this Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. Acts 2 verse 36, they had put the son of God to death and they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter didn't say, well, Jesus prayed for your forgiveness, so you're fine. He said, repent, turn away from your sin and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, Acts 2 verse 38. Forgiveness, brothers and sisters and friends, is available. It is conditional upon us coming to Jesus and throwing ourselves upon his mercy and living an obedient, faithful life in his service. It's conditional. But this prayer also tells me about forgiveness, that forgiveness is complete. If God says to you, you are forgiven, if he makes that promise to you, you can take a tremendous amount of assurance from what's being said. The scripture says in Hebrews 7 verse 25 that the high priest we have is able to save to the uttermost. There is nothing lacking. There's no place in your life where he's unable to help you. If you'll just come to him, it will be complete blanket forgiveness. When we come to him, we bring all of our lives to him. And we say, Lord, I want to serve and to be faithful to you. I want to die to sin, Romans 6, verses 1 and 2. Complete forgiveness. Your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more, Hebrews 8 and verse 12. Father, forgive them. As I look at this statement, a third item to be observed 
is the unbelief, the blindness of the people on that occasion. Notice what he says. They know not what they do. They're blind. There are some other passages in your New Testament. You might jot these down and study them. Acts chapter 13, verses 26 through 29. Acts chapter 13, verses 26 through 29. Paul is preaching on that occasion to some people far away. And he says, the people in Jerusalem, they and their rulers, when they were nailing Jesus to the cross, They didn't understand who he was, and they certainly had not listened to the voices of the prophets who were read every Sabbath, because if they had understood those things, they wouldn't have done what they did. And not only that, they fulfilled the words of the prophets in crucifying him. They didn't know, because they had turned their hearts and minds away from the God of heaven, and they weren't being honest with the evidence that was before them. Another passage to jot down is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, where Paul again writes, if the rulers of this age had known who Jesus was, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. There's something about sin, brothers and sisters and friends, that is always deceitful. Sin always holds the promise of making things better, of making things easier, of providing something that we think we really want. Sin always holds out that promise and sin always deceives us in this regard. It never ever shows you what it's going to cost. It never shows you the full implications of what you're doing. You only find that out after the fact. And so it is as people are nailing Jesus to the cross. They think they're getting their will done. They think they're getting things done that, that, that they think is going to make Israel better. Get this guy out of the way. But they're crucifying the Lord of glory. I'm so glad that Jesus prayed for forgiveness. Aren't you from the cross? As you think about what's going through his mind and you think about what he's, what he's contemplating as all of this evil is happening to him. Not because he's done anything wrong, but because people just hated him. They were envious of him, Matthew 27, verse 18. And Jesus has forgiveness on his mind. That tells me something about the heart of the God that we serve. It tells me that there is hope for every single one of us. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. Second, look in the passage at Luke 23 and verse 43. The thief on the cross is having a conversation with Jesus and he says in Luke 23, 42, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Two observations about this. Observation number one, there were three crosses on Calvary. Keep that in your mind when you picture the cross as you're contemplating Jesus during the Lord's Supper. There were always three crosses. Isaiah 53 verses 11 and 12 tell us that Jesus, the Messiah, the suffering servant, was going to be numbered with the transgressors. That is, in his death, he was going to be counted as a common criminal. He was going to be numbered and counted with those who were sinners. And so, prophecy is fulfilled. There are two criminals. And the Bible is very explicit about the order in which the crosses are arranged. There is a thief on the left side of Jesus. There is a thief on the right side of Jesus. And Jesus in the middle. In fact, John 19 explains that very clearly. And the scripture tells us that one of the crosses was a cross of rebellion. Luke 23, verse 39, one thief rails against Jesus. If you are the son of God, save yourself and save us, he says. The other thief, the scripture seems to indicate, repented. When you read Matthew 27, Matthew's account says that the thieves, plural, the criminals, plural, railed against Jesus. It seems like at first, both of these men were mocking Jesus along with the crowds. 
But something about this thief, something about what he was seeing take place, maybe it was the prayer. Maybe it was the way that Jesus carried his dignity even in the most undignified circumstance. He saw something in Jesus and he changed his heart and he changed his mind about who Jesus is. And so this thief is on a cross you might call a cross of repentance, a cross of rebellion, a cross of repentance. And he turns to his compatriot, the other thief on the far side of Jesus and says, don't you even fear God? We're under the same condemnation, but this man's done nothing wrong. And then he addresses Jesus, Lord, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. If ever in the Bible, there was a statement of faith, that's it. Because he is a dying man stretched out on a cross, speaking to another dying man also stretched out on the cross. Both of these men have hours to live, literally. They are not going to last. And this thief says, I want you to remember me. When your kingdom comes, when you fulfill all the things that you've been talking about, please remember me. A statement of faith. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe in who you are. And that's when the cross of redemption upon which Jesus is hung takes center stage. Truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Observation number two, this is a promise. It's a promise. And I'd like you to notice, just as you look at the grammar of the statement on the screen behind me, I'd like you to notice as Jesus makes this promise to a dying man, listen to some of the assurances that we can take with us as well. Notice that there is authority in this promise. I say to you, who is Jesus after all? He is the Son of God. He is the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. He is the one who is the Son of God has come to ransom man from his sin. He speaks with authority. I say to you. But notice, notice as well, not just the authority of the promise, but the veracity of it. Truly, I say to you. Verily, verily, I say to you. Some translations might have. If Jesus had just started his statement by saying, I say to you, that's enough. But he says, very truly, there is certainty. What he's telling you is the truth. Jesus always spoke the truth. There is no lie in him. He is light and in him there is no darkness at all. 1 John chapter 1 verses 5 through 7. Jesus is without sin and without any kind of deceit in him. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. And so what he's about to tell the thief, you can take it to the bank, as they say. It's true. As you look at this promise, notice the speed of it. Be with me in paradise. You see that? When someone passes from a place where they're going to be until judgment. And so it is in this case, when Jesus speaks to the thief on the cross, that's what happened to both of these men. And yet their spirits went this very day, Jesus says, as you look at the promise that Jesus made in paradise, But I'll give you this, if Jesus says that someone is going to be with him in a place that he the world that God has made, look at the places that people like to go, especially on vacation. Look at the intricacy of the place that God looks at all this that we see in this world and God says, oh yeah, but I've got something even better in store for you, a place that I call paradise. This day, you'll be. Incidentally, that indicates.
religious friends like to say. When Jesus died on the the scripture tells us in this passage, he was going with the thief to a place called paradise. This is well, the company of it. And this is the very best thing about the promise. Today, you, thief, will be with me. That we get to be with God. That we get to be with Jesus Christ. The to live as Christ, I, I want to live and I, I'm working with him and I'm serving him. Christ, but to die is gain. And in the very 23, to depart and to be. anything that you could experience in this world will be with me is the most amazing promise to a dying man on a cross it's speaking to a man who by faith has come to before I leave this sometimes people say well there's an example of there's no question about that based on what Jesus said. This man lived and died under the old covenant. We are under a new covenant. And the terms of the new covenant are different from the terms of the old. He had the power on earth to forgive sins any way he wanted. Mark chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. In Mark 2, verses 9 and 10, Jesus says to a man who is lame, arise, take up your bed and walk. And he does that to prove that what he just told the man before was true. Your sins are forgiven. But he wanted while he was here on earth. And now he has bound up forgiveness of sins in coming to him in obedient faith and being baptized. Chapter 23, notice verse 46. There's darkness. There are all kinds of things taking place, all kinds of people mocking him. And finally, after suffering, after an agonizing experience, Jesus finally says with a loud voice, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. It's a word of assurance. When you think about what Jesus did, specifically, item number one, Jesus died. He really died. There are some people that have tried over the years to explain the resurrection by saying that Jesus never really expired. He never really died. That didn't happen. He passed out and his, his heart rate fell so that people, people thought he was dead, but when they buried him, they buried him alive. And that's why his body was found missing later. People have tried to make that argument. That's not what the Bible indicates and it's certainly not what the evidence indicates. In, Ma in Mark chapter 15, the scripture tells us that Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate was surprised, it says in Mark 15, that Jesus was dead because it was so, so soon. And so he called the centurion who was watching over the crucifixion and said, is it true that he's dead? The centurion said, yes. Yeah, he really has expired. In John's account, we read this before the Lord's Supper this morning, if you were paying attention. In John's account, they went to break the legs of the men who were on the crosses to help speed along their death. The scripture tells us in John 19 that Jesus was already dead. So there was no did both of the thieves so that they would die more quickly. They took a spear and they put it in Jesus' side and out came blood and water. The Bible gives abundant evidence backed up by eyewitnesses to what happened that Jesus actually died. His
26. Notice secondly, as you think about there was no fear. There was no anxiety about assurance. Father, into you. Death has been called the undiscovered country. Tell the tale. Oh, I know there are some people that have. Do not believe for a second that anybody has been to the other side and come back with stories that are accurate. I don't believe that. We die is found in God's word. That's the only assurance that we have. And the reason why Jesus could die with such confidence is because he had put his entire life, his entire ministry, his entire being into serving and obeying and loving the God of heaven. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus is the epitome of that. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus epitomizes that. And because he lived his life that way, in the moment, in the hour of his death, he could die with confidence because he knew the God into whom his, hand, his spirit was being When we think about what it means to die, Jesus shows us how. He shows us how to die with confidence. By the way, this is a quotation of a psalm, Psalm 31, verse 5. It's a psalm that historically Jewish young people would pray. Father, into your hands we commit our spirit. As young people, they would say this. Jesus uses this and appropriates it for the moment of his death. He died confidently. Third, as you look at this passage, he died willingly. Jesus did not, his life was not taken from him. Jesus gave it up. In John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. No one takes my life from me, he says. It's 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Now listen to what he says. For the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What did Jesus do for me? Jesus gave himself. He died willingly. This was a sacrifice, yes, but Jesus was a willing sacrifice. He died so that you could know him. Willingly. And finally, Jesus died victoriously. He had finished the work that God gave him to do. John 17, verses 1 through 5. It is finished. John 19, verse 30. Jesus had finished everything that God gave him to do, and thus he gained the victory over the devil. He gained the victory over death. He gained the victory for you and me over ourselves. He died victoriously. And friends, you can have victory in him. You can have an assurance and a confidence things, those gracious things in your life if you come to Jesus and his cross. That's the challenge that the Bible holds out to you. Acknowledge that you're like the thieves. You are guilty and you will bear the penalty for your guilt. Acknowledge that, but then turn your eyes and turn your life to the one who can save you and redeem you. You can be saved from your sin you can be forgiven because of what Jesus Christ did for you at the cross. He always knew exactly what to say. He taught people how to live the abundant life, John 10, verse 10. He teaches people how to die. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Maybe you need to come to Christ this morning because you know that you're outside of him and you want the forgiveness that only he can provide. Do what those people in the the book of Acts were told to do on the day of Pentecost. Believe in Jesus, confess his name, repent of your sin, be baptized for the remission of your sins. And Jesus promises forgiveness. He promises hope and assurance 
even in the face of death itself. What a wonderful Savior. You'll never find anyone who can do for you what Jesus can do. If we can help you to obey the gospel this morning or with any other need, won't you make that known together while, while together we stand and while we sing. Nay, 